Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. This week's session, open discussion on automation. But before we do this, I do believe that last week I forgot to show off our image of the week. So that is going to be this week's image of the week. And let me just realize something. Big session, open discussion on I always uh, screw that up, but uh, here we go. Let's see if I can share that screen with you. Sorry as I jump between a million windows that are open on my desktop. And if I showed this off last week, I don't remember whether I showed this off mid-session or not, but uh, it, it is a great image, so I just wanted to show it off uh, or make sure I showed it off. Uh, M76 by Peter Goodhue. Uh, so, of course, this is the Little Dumbbell Nebula, and this is a small target. So he did uh, mention that it is a crop, I believe, of a larger image, uh, but there is a lot of detail in this. Uh, please go to our website, theastromissionchannel.com, and uh, check this out uh, in normal resolution so you're not looking at it through the, uh, I don't know, through the stream. Um, and at the same time, uh, check out all the images, leave a comment, or uh, submit your images up here, and uh, maybe we will uh, share your image as the image of the week. That said, uh, I am jumping back. Find which window I need. taking back my camera. Okay, so uh, I mentioned this last week. At, uh, we're doing, uh, we still have open discussions. Whenever we don't have any specific presentation, we're still going to have these open discussions, but I'm going to try and keep the topics focused on particular uh, topics that I think we can cover without jumping all over the place, and we'll also make it a little bit more searchable for new users or whoever it may be that wants to search it. So, of course, this week's session is on automation. Um, this always comes up. Last week this came up. Uh, I think once you get to a particular point, once you're comfortable with your imaging, you kind of want to make the automation routine simpler uh, or, or just in general your routine simpler where uh, – if you're like us, uh, you basically set it up and, uh, I don't know, go to sleep. Uh, but you do have to check in on it. There's there's still stuff you want. You can't just leave it out there. You can't just not think about it. So we're all checking on it. So we each have our own routine. Uh, there's a few different pieces of software that will basically allow you to automate your setup. Uh, and in the room, I believe we have three different, uh, three users of three different pieces of software. So I'm going to share uh, a little bit of the software that I use. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to share something that we probably all use. Uh, I, I, I went around the room before and I asked, uh, what do you guys use for remote desktop software? Or uh, how do you get into your automation PC? Let's say it's sitting out on your driveway or sitting in your observatory or sitting in New Mexico. Um, how do you get into that PC? Uh, so a, f uh, a few people said they used Windows Remote Desktop. And I've used that on, uh, I I've used that before for a number of different things. But my acquisition laptop is 15 years old. So it is not remote desktop compatible. So I end up using TeamViewer. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show off how simple this really is to use. Uh, wow, you see the crazy screen right there. Uh, let me, let me uh, make that disappear. And uh, you can see our chat now live. Uh, bottom right here, TeamViewer is just kind of always running. And it actually shows me all of my PCs. This could come in handy for non-Astro photography related things um <coughs> so excuse me um my acquisition pc adam ap pc i i basically just program these in you have to download the client on the pc and then you download it on whatever other pc you want to use or even your phone or your ipad so yeah you can basically do it from bed if you choose uh once it's set up you double click it and then bam you are in to the PC that you are using to acquire your images. Um, that's it. Uh, now, TeamViewer is 
free for non-commercial uses, which astrophotography is non-commercial unless you're selling a lot of your images. Uh, <coughs> but I'm not sure that many of us are selling that many images that we would get flagged for using it commercially. And even so, I think you'd be okay uh, one way or another. But um, if you're using it to log into work or whatever it may be, yes, you can get flagged and they can cut your account out. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, Team Viewer, check it out, uh, download it on your PC, Mac, or iPhone, or all of the above for that matter. Uh, I use um, Sequence Generator Pro as my acquisition software. Uh, it integrates with PhD Guiding. Uh, I'm going to close these out and just kind of log back in so I can show Sequence Generator Pro. Um, made by Main Sequence Software. Uh, we've had uh, the developers on the Astrovision channel in the past, and uh, they kind of ran through it and really showed um, a lot of what it could do. Uh, but uh, I'm going to show you one of the, what I'll call the most complex part of it, but uh, what allows it to become really simple and really easy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, sorry about that. Um, so basically, I, I, I think you can appreciate what automation software does. Uh, most of us here have done this manually, I will say. Um, we've probably even push the button on the DSLR camera ourselves just to see what would happen uh, at one point, maybe early on in our astrophotography careers. But uh, eventually, yeah, you want to simplify. Uh, so you think about all this stuff that you're actually doing. Uh, you're pointing your mount. Well, first of all, you're setting up your mount. You're hooking your camera up. You're pointing your mount. You're focusing. There's a lot of stuff that you have to do. So to automate, there's a lot of things that have to be taken into account. And basically, any automation software that you're going to use, you're going to be setting up your equipment on. Sequence Generator Pro allows you to set up a number of different profiles. So let's say you have a, a Mach 1 mount, but you have an Edge HD and you have a William Optic Star 71. Well, you can set each of those profiles up individually. Let's say sometimes you use your DSLR. Uh, but you may use it on any one of your telescopes or possibly only with a lens. Uh, you can set that up as a profile. So basically, by setting up those individual profiles, the software knows a lot more and can automate a lot more of it. Um, as as uh, Let me go to the setup that I use most typically. Um, here we go. So I set up my uh, RC, my 10-inch RC with my focal reducer and my STF 8300 set up with my LRGB filters. Now, there's a lot of stuff there, but each one of those components has its own nuances that has to be taken care of. For example, uh, let's start with the CCD camera. Uh, the CCD camera, I need to tell it what temperature I want it to cool down to, how long I want it to take. Do I want to cool it down at the, camera, uh, at the start? After that, and possibly more importantly, um, the angle of the camera, the pixel scale of the camera, uh, the readout noise, and the size of the chip in pixels. When I enter those, uh, it allows the cam, uh, it allows the automation software to get a little bit more info, which will give it the info it needs to plate solve. So there, I'm, I'm taking care of my accurate pointing by setting up those components. Filters, well, of course, it has to know which filters you're using. Uh, I have RGB here, but in this uh, uh, profile, I use uh, narrowband filters. So I have these set up differently in case I decide to switch the filters out. I don't want to go in and have to change this. I just click a different profile and go to it. At the same time, I might have a particular target uh, that, say, is a narrowband target. And I just shot it in narrowband. 
then I switch to this profile because I wanted to shoot something in RGB. Well, then I switch back to this. Well, the target has to be shot again in narrow band. So it gives it, uh, it allows me to shoot multiple nights without any real complexity. It just, just does it, and I, I, I can kind of forget about it. I use autofocus. I have to tell it what type of focuser I have, and I do have to uh, tell it the fine focus step size and the coarse focus step size. And basically, um, uh, I believe maybe in the focuser I set up, um, uh, I set up a way for it to know uh, a little bit how fo uh, how much each step is. Uh, each step or motor might turn a little bit different, uh, a little bit more or less per step. Uh, this is where I tell it that much so that I can use autofocus. Um, autofocus, uh, well, how, how am I going to autofocus? Am I going to do it every time it changes one degree? Do I want to autofocus every frame, autofocus every so and so minutes? Uh, autofocus on the start, uh, autofocus on filter change. Uh, or I can set up compensation for each filter. Uh, a lot of complexities, but when you slowly set them up, uh, as you go through and slowly set one component up at a time, make sure it's bulletproof, then eventually you get through all of them, and you get to the point where you click a button, you walk inside, and uh, I don't know, you check your phone every few hours, and that's about it. At the, uh, in the morning, uh, you check your data. If you have enough, you start processing. Uh, the 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 most difficult thing, I don't know, the most time uh, consuming actual work thing is probably transferring the files over. Uh, so you really don't. Uh, this really can do everything for you. Um, plate solving, you can set it up. Uh, you set it up to either plate solve over the internet or plate solve locally. Um, and auto guiding. Uh, PhD does auto guiding. I'm sure most of you are familiar with auto guiding. Uh, Sequence Generator Pro integrates with PhD and really does a lot of smart stuff. Uh, dithering, for example. Um, also, um, PhD itself has a uh, polar alignment routine. So if you are portable, and you need a quick polar alignment routine, uh, you're already going to have to open PHD. You're already going to have to calibrate PHD. Uh, what's another 15-minute step polar aligning? And then uh, you're basically good to go. It's actually drift aligning. Uh, so it's uh, you're going to get an extremely accurate drift alignment. Um, so you set your profiles up, and basically all of a sudden, uh, you're ready to go. Uh, new sequence with profile. Um, so I picked that profile, and uh, now that the profile is set, um, this is how easy it can actually get. Uh, framing in Mosaic Wizard. Um, what did I just do? I just typed in Orion, and it showed me a picture of the Orion Nebula in like a split second. Uh, what? Why is it showing me a picture of the Orion Nebula? It just it just grabbed it for me. It's I can uh, let's say uh, I don't know. I want I'm doing a longer focal length uh, version of it. Uh, I type in two degrees. I change the the field of view. Um, there gave me the image. Uh, let me change the stretch on this so we can see a little bit more of it. But uh, wh what's it doing? It's showing me what's up there. It's not a planetarium software. It's showing me what's up there. Uh, so what it allows me to do, and this is the really what uh, Sequence Generator Pro shines at, it allows me to draw a little box, drag that box over whatever target I want, uh, whatever point I want, to image. Um, this is the field of view with my uh, RC. I can go to the core of the Orion. I can 
get some dark dust up here. I could pick out, it, it, this really allows you to get a lot more artistic with your framing. You know, we're in the Orion Nebula, but let's go to four degrees. Uh, let me darken that up so we can see it. There's an interesting little dark nebula, right? Oops. Oh, God. I spoiled the surprise. Spoiled the surprise. Um, a lot of you may have seen this before. What am I looking for right there? Uh, a lot of you may have seen this before. A really interesting dark nebula right there that on its own could make a cool image. And you might not think of something like that unless you have a, a true image of this. You don't get that so much in planetarium software. So what, what you get here is an actual image that you can stretch and look for little things wherever they may be. Then frame them. What happens if you're long focal length but you want to get a big mosaic of something? Well, you, that's what I, I spoiled the surprise on before. Uh, let's say your rectangle is a little bit bigger than one frame. It automatically draws the four frames. Let's center it right there. Uh, let me create the sequence. I'm just going to call it Orion. We're going to use precision centering with plate solve. I'm not going to auto rotate because I don't um, have a rotator. And I do want to associate the image with this sequence. Uh, It's telling me that it can't validate the angle. Uh, as long as I had the angle set properly earlier, uh, I'm fine. If I didn't, then I'm in trouble. But uh, that's one of those things you have to pay attention to. Uh, create this sequence. Now, look right there. Uh, I'm going to delete this one out, as I always do. Each frame, each panel of my mosaic is set up in there. Run, filter. I'm set up as narrow band, which maybe I don't want to do. Uh, let's go 30 minutes, uh, 16 subs, uh, got light. We're going to run three of these, H alpha, O3, S2, all are going to be 30 minutes. All are going to be 16 subs. Um, so, uh, Remaining time, 24 hours. Well, wait a minute. It's only, there's only eight hours of dark sky, right? Um, yeah. I'm going to run as much as I can, and then tomorrow or next time it's clear, I'm just going to continue the sequence. And it's going to remember how many it's taken. Uh, it's going to rotate through them. Uh, so it's going to start filling up this bar. And when it's done, I'm, it's done. Uh, well, of course, that's only one panel. Uh, I have all these other panels to do. Uh, but I'm going to, copy the events from here and you can see it automatically sets up the filters they're all set to run uh, all set to run um, I have to tell it where on my computer I want to store it. Uh, and basically, uh, that, that's what I do to set up my imaging session. I, I did that and, uh, that was a more complex one because it was a mosaic. Usually it's, I don't know, 30 seconds, a minute. Um, I connect my camera, my filter wheel, my focuser, my telescope. Uh, for me, I have to walk outside and flip a switch and, and uh, plug in something, uh, but turn them on, uh, then click Run Sequence, and I walk away, and it basically does everything I need to do. In the morning, uh, when it starts to get light out, it'll basically just park itself. Um, it'll automatically flip on the, mo uh, on the meridian. It'll automatically plate solve the first... Uh, image, it'll automatically place all after it flips. If there were two different targets in here, uh, let's say I get eight, uh, four hours on this and six hours on this, uh, I just set that up. And uh, it's a way to maximize your sky time.
this is the way that basically all automation software has to work. Uh, all of these uh, aspects from the setting up the camera, the filter wheel, which filters, uh, the, how you're going to focus uh, the telescope so that it knows what commands uh, the telescope can accept, uh, of course, where you're going to store it, and your, your actual routine. All automation software is going to basically do the same thing. Um, some of it is going to allow, uh, some planning software is going to do it a little bit differently, but basically that's where it is. Um, even over here in Sequence Generator Pro, it shows your PhD graphs, graph, so you've got a nice uh, console here. Shows you a quick stretch of your images if you need a quick stretch. Uh, you get your image statistics, which you can sample as well. Um, this is the progress bar on the sequence. You can see total 96 hours, target 24 hours. Uh, tells me my current filter position. Um, and this allows me to do some focus on the fly uh, stuff. Uh, frame and focus. If I, if I wanted to manually focus, uh, then I, I could use that. Or if I want to set up focus at the beginning of a session, which uh, I do suggest focus being closed before you uh, start the session. Uh, you can do that. Uh, camera cooler. Basically, that's everything. That's Sequence Generator Pro um, in a nutshell, how you set it up and uh, how how kind of all automation software works. Okay, I did a lot of talking right there. I do have a couple other people in the room, and uh, I thought maybe they could show off their automation software. Um, let me grab that screen back. Oh, you can see it. Okay, um, who uh, who is willing to show? I know uh, Tolga was having mic problems. Eric, uh, are you able to pull yours up and just show us a little bit about? Um, sure, what you sure got? I can do that. Uh, give me just a moment. D Dylan's asking, can Sequence Generator Pro be used to run sky surveys, uh, single subs across dozens of galaxies? Um, so you know, you could probably set it up. Um, but I don't think that their framing in Mosaic Wizard itself is set up to run that way. Uh, it might be better to manually set it up. Uh, 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 but you know what? I also think there's a limit to the number of targets you can put in there. So it, de it might depend on how many targets you wanted to use. Uh, I don't think specifically Secret Generator Pro is going to do that. I don't think that's what the Secret Standard Pro is going to shine at. Um, but uh, you, you may be able to. I don't know if they increase the number of targets you can set up in it. Uh, yeah, you, you can use DSO browser to create runs. Uh, for a survey, though, I don't know um, how many you would use, uh, how many you would use, uh, how many images you would want, or, or I should say, how many different. Uh, targets you would want because there might be a limit on that. Adam, you want me to uh, share a screen? And... Go ahead, Eric. Okay. Uh, can you see what I'm? So I use a different automation software, um, probably one that's been around longer than anything else, and that's ACP, Astronomy Control Protocol. And we're right in the middle of a run, so I can't really tell, show you all the setup because I'm actually imaging. What you see there in the screen is a shot from the Sierra Remote Observatories, and that's our telescope, uh, Riccardi Honda's 1159 focal length um, scope with a 16200 camera and a rotator focuser kind of in the middle if you look between the camera there and the scope. And that's the focuser. Uh, the bright light you see is a really bright moon. It's not the greatest time to be imaging, but it's a clear night, and I thought I'd capture some images. And let's see. So what we use is a combination. Well, let's go back here. So that's Maxim. That's my capture software. And there you see one of the images, hydrogen alpha from the Flaming Star Nebula. It's not real bright, but if I stack up about six or seven uh, hours worth of images, you'll have a very nice little loop of emission nebula. And on the right here, you see the, this is the guide graph, which looks pretty good. 
uh, reasonably flat. Over on the left, you see the uh, the guide star. We actually got two. Hopefully, that doesn't mess up the guiding, but it seems to be reasonably going well. And can't really see it well, but here is an image, and we're up to about 400 seconds out of 900 seconds at bin one. And uh, that's maximum running. Uh, the control is all through ACP, and this is the ACP interface. It's not the most elegant in interface, but it really does everything. It allows you to set all your preferences, all your telescopes, your cameras, just the way, just the way Adam described it uh, earlier, except it's set in the preferences in ACP. And the way you set up a target is first you have to see what target you is that you want to look at, and there are various ways to do it. One of the programs that I use now is called Guide 9. Uh, it's not used very much, but it's very accurate, has some nice graphics. And here you see the frame of the camera, which I can move around. And here you see the guide chip, which I can also move around. So basically, I tell it to go to the flaming star, which is IC405. And then I just position it the way I want. Uh, I can set up the, let's see, view the CCD frame. There's a CCD frame, so I can rotate that around so I can have a guide star. Uh, let's say I want it right there. So now the coordinates that I want to use are right here in the lower left. Probably can't read them, but I can take those and then put them directly into ACP Planner, which is the planning part of ACP, and I do have that open. So here is ACP Planner, and I got it set up for uh, an object that I'm going to image probably tomorrow night, which is a cone in fox fur. And basically, we take, let's see, edit this. Uh, I'm not sure you can read it, but here is the name of the object. Here is the RA and deck, and here is the rotation angle, which in this case happens to be zero of the rotator. And I get those coordinates either from Guide 9 or sometimes I'll actually do it from the Sky X, which I'll show you in a moment. And I set up, I want to do a hydrogen alpha, 26 exposures, 900 seconds. And I save that and I'm all set. And I'm just going to close it. It's going to tell me you haven't saved it, but I've already saved it. Now, when you start a run, basically you go in here and you see where it says acquire images. That is your script that you're selecting. You then go down here and click run, which I've already done because I'm already imaging the, the flaming star. You select the script that I just created and you tell it to run and it does everything for you. I usually watch it for about half an hour because it's kind of fun. It's really better than TV sometimes to see the little image appear on your screen and your star focused in a nice flat guide graph. And you watch one or two images come in. Then you shut it down and you come back in the morning and you upload all of your, your subs. And the way you do that is open file transfer. Let me move that over here. Now, let's see, we got this calibration. And these are downloaded into a NAS that I have off of my desktop. And basically, you just take this, and then I think there should be, here's a couple in here. Take it here and download it. And so I would normally wait till the mornings where I download the 26 subs, but I can just download those two now. We're done. And now I think if I open up Pix Insight, we can see what we got. Usually the first couple of subs are a little bit ragged, but we'll give it a try. Well, Pix Insight doesn't seem to be cooperating right now. 
Uh, let's see. Are we running? I, I was talking to a muted mic. Sean, uh, I think we had the prison people on uh, to show off their uh, software for a bit. Uh, we did a past show on that, so uh, worth looking oh, cool. up. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's really neat looking software. I like SG Pro, though. It's going to be hard to get me off SG Pro. Okay, it looks like that has that part that hasn't worked, but basically you download your images, you open them up in Pix Insight, and you start to do your processing. And we'll process now, we'll collect data till about 2 in the morning, uh, about 26, 2 in the morning California time, about 26 images, and I'll have the first night of HA for the Flaming Star. And that's a little bit of ACP. Adam? Thank you, Eric. Um, now, Tolga uses a different piece of software. Uh, How's my sound? Uh, go ahead. Oh. Uh, better right then. OK. I mean, I could, I could show you. So what I'm doing tonight is I have a color camera, so I'm actually not imaging tonight. At Focus 3 is out with SkyX, so Commander just incorporated at Focus 3 into, and so I was just testing that. Um, I'll, I'll share my screen and I'll show you guys what I'm doing. Awesome. Let me know if it's working. I see your screen. So here's my uh, CCD Commander uh, computer. So I'm. <clears throat> Everything is uh, set up right now. I'm just uh, I just did a small test. Uh, wait for the sun. Turn on the cooler. Home the mount. Wait for the sun again to a higher altitude. Open my flip flat. Five sixty second exposures of M forty five. Do that fifty times. But of course we're not going to do that. We might let one finish. And then skip when the sun rises to uh, nautical twilight, close the flip flat, the cooler, and park the mount. So I just hit up. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I might have to restart this. Wait. I might have to restart the CCD commander. So it, it automatically launches all the software. Basically, load your actions and hit play. And it's going to, it just connected the camera. Now it's actually homing the mount. Uh, you can see here. That'll take a second. I'm actually blind right now. I, I don't even have a camera to. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm doing this completely blind. But let's. Go finding home. That'll take like uh, 30 seconds. Home. Now it's opening the flip flat. Uh, now it's moving to M forty five. Once it moves there, it's going to take a you know it's going to do a plate solve, which is basically take a picture, make sure you're there over is that taking a four second image that's, that's really cool uh, here's the plate solved image move it over so we can oh I can't here's the plate solved picture 
stop your offset. And now next thing is going to do a focus run. And here's this is my first time. So you guys are watching this live. I have no idea what it's going to do. This is a whole completely brand new focusing routine from uh, Software Bisque. Let's see what it does. Took a picture. Uh, so it does this uh, multiple star thing. There you go. Now, this is not going to give us any information. But this this might. Toga, how long does it take to set all that up? Uh, the setup takes a little bit because uh, you kind of have to tell it what to do one at a time, almost like a like – I can't show you right now because it's running. I did a whole show about how to set this up in one of the past episodes. Okay. But it's it's – because it's kind of like a robot. You, okay, it's done. I think. Oh, focus failed. It said. So this this was live. So. So let's stop it. Oh, it keeps trying. It's gonna try again. Oh, so and, and back to this at focus thing, at focus three thing, it does multiple star focusing. So I'm pretty excited about it, but I really don't know how it's going to work with this CCD, the automation. It looks really, really cool. The, the cool things about it is that you kind of don't have to be, it, it seeks focus. Uh, it tries to find the V, the bottom of the V curve, and if you can't find it, it'll go to the smallest number, and it'll start a new focus run from that number. So it's so it's it's really intuitive. It shouldn't really fail, but I don't know. Is CCD Commander a, a separate uh, software package? Oh, and it started. The, it started the first exposure. First run, it couldn't find perfect focus, but it, it moved the focuser. It started a new focus run position and started the next exposure. Got it. Uh, I'm only doing a 60-second exposure. We'll just do one and then shut it down. So, Sean, go ahead. You had a question? Yeah, is CCD Commander, is that a separate type software that could sit on any kind of platform, or is it just specifically for this one? So CCD Commander is not like SGP in a sense that it doesn't do anything by itself. It's Maxim or uh, Sky, SkyX, it will run other imaging software yeah okay that's what i was thinking cool right on right like it's not like sgp uh, gotcha. this was the first uh just downloading let's see what it looks like now oh, there you go So this is a really wide – oh, another thing I forgot to mention, I don't guide with the system, so it's all unguided. That's why there was no guiding. So it just did an unguided dither. It just moved the telescope a little bit, and it started the next exposure. But I'm not going to continue. Here's the dither. 
complete moving it just moves the mount a little bit small d delay and then starts the next exposure but i'm gonna stop this awesome thanks for demonstrating the new uh, focus uh, routine um so oh, adam cool. yeah I, can, I think it's worthwhile to kind of differentiate the degrees of automation of the different pieces of software because there are some, I mean, if you want to go all the way and something like ACP and use their, uh, not their planner, there's another piece of software. Basically, it'll do everything by itself, accumulate images for a variety of targets uh, according to the parameters that you set up, and you just download them and you never have to pay any attention. Uh, that is more appealing to some people than me because even though I can't touch this software because it's remote, or touch the telescope, I can at least touch the software and I can see it perform. So you have that kind of um, little bit of intimacy with what's going on rather than just images showing up in the morning and you don't really have any connection to the actual hardware. Yep. And that's what, uh, uh, do you guys want me to, do you guys want me to show you this at focus three by itself without CCD commander? Sure. We have a little bit of time. If you could, yeah, so, if you could pull it up, uh, can you guys still can you can you guys still see my screen? Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna run at Focus Three. Uh, here's the new button that uh, showed up with the new version of SkyX. Now, if you download the new version, and you basically click on it, and this new control center shows up. The, one of the first things you, you you're supposed to do is to you're supposed to categorize your uh, characterize your autofocuser, but I've already done that. So uh, I'm just going to take a sample picture, which is a two second exposure. Things might go wrong here because this is brand new. And we're live. And we're live. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually counting on it, Tolga. <laughs> so I'm going to click on, I'm going to try to make this as automated as possible. So I'm going to click on auto set focus subframe. Okay, on autofocus now. And you'll see how it finds focus. Oh, yeah, there you go. Is that a moonlight focuser or a night crawler or something you got on there or what? No, no, this is one of, one of my belt. Uh, this is the VSD with the little belt focuser. I got you. So it's a RoboFocus controller on it. OK. So that's interesting. I see it actually determining the proper uh, uh, exposure based on the saturation of the pixels. Right. Yep. It sets the exposure time, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, can you guys uh, see the, what's going on on the bottom right clearly? Yep. Okay. Tolga, why don't you explain what that green box is doing? Okay, so three samples. So it's it moves the focuser, takes three pictures, moves it to three pic. The, these dots are the same focus position. So it took three here, three here, three here, three here, figured out uh, that this green line is the best focuser position. It moved it over there and took a final picture. The best uh, 1.9 FWHM, it was at 872. 
I mean, not, I mean, eighteen thousand eight seven two was the best position. So it's not. So it takes an average. Numbers. It's That's just simply doing a focus run based on uh, the image, the sample image. It's not a normal focus run like the way we're used to. Richard Wright developed this. I don't know what he did in the background. It uses uh, brightness, uh, FWHM, and and it'll just search. It'll search forever until it finds focus. But when it shoots the three images, it, it takes the average of the three and, yeah. and makes a measurement yeah. from that? Right, exactly. But that three, pick how many. Right. You, you can do one of, on, on yeah. each position. Yeah, I got you. That's one. And is it uh, suggested to use three positions or? Um, uh, no, here, I'll, I'll show you over here. Uh -huh. Samples, three. You can right. set. You can set it to anything you want, you know, well, that, like from uh, one. Is that the number of images that it takes, or is that the number of uh, positions of the focuser? No, the, on this type of thing, the positions, you don't, you don't, you can't adjust. It finds, it keeps doing it until it finds it. Okay. You only get to pick your search span, mm -hmm. each, uh, try and then the number of samples so it, it takes the three samples based on seeing conditions and picks out the one it likes the best and then moves on to the next one i tell it to do three yeah that, that would work for me yeah like That's you good. could i could do one but in this case i did three just in case some you know you you don't yeah, want to you don't want to rely on one right you get better seeing who knows uh -huh. So anyhow, so do you so start with the generally in focus or near the focus position? Right, that's that's my point. No, it doesn't have to be. I mean, you have to have a light source. Necessarily start at focus. If if it finds that the if it cannot find uh, when it does a focus, it tries to find a V. It needs to find the minimum number. And it needs to see the number is going up. If it doesn't see the number go up, it will keep moving the focuser until it sees it going back up. So you could be way off focus and it'll find focus. Interesting. It's very interesting. But, but then again, no, this is no B curves, right? So uh, it doesn't look at the behavior of your focuser by constructing a curve from which it will use later for focus. Correct. Right. Yeah, it looks like it just goes and shoots, you know, however many samples, decides what it needs to go and goes to the next one and keeps doing it till it finds its focus. That's pretty cool. Right. Uh, but, but then again, I mean, this is very new technology. Things could have went wrong here, so we just got locked out a little bit. I just tried it for the first time in front of you guys. Cool. Part of it. Thank you, Tola. Um, oh. I do. Uh, there, there was a question asked uh, earlier, which is kind of good to point out here. Um, is there advantage to stripping all the software from your acquisition PC and only keeping the software you use for automation and image processing? And uh, it was quickly answered. Uh, yes, uh, or I should say, uh, no, not necessarily because even though there's a lot going on, uh, plate solving, all of that stuff, um, it doesn't really take a strong PC. Uh, it, it, it's not very, uh, 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 difficult no. for a, a, a 15 year old laptop to do all of this stuff. Uh, you don't need the latest and greatest. You don't need to spend fifteen hundred dollars on the on a brand new laptop. In fact, I suggest not spending all that money on a laptop. Uh, find an old laptop and put the software on it because you're going to be putting it outside. You're going to get tons of dew on it. Um, you're going to be abusing it. You're going to be tossing it in the back of your car. Uh, it could break because uh, that's how you break stuff. Um, and any old laptop will do. You don't need 
some, uh, you don't need the i7. You're not processing on this computer. You're basically just acquiring and then transferring it off and sending it to a desktop or uh, a laptop that actually can do it. Um, I have had zero reason to replace my 15-year-old laptop, so I continue using it. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. I have a good reason to replace my 15-year-old laptop. The C key does not work on it, which makes looking up any NGC object uh, really, really difficult. Um, my workaround has been to cut and paste a C from somewhere else into it rather than typing it, but uh, that's my workaround. Guess I need a new laptop, 15 years now. Um, but one good suggestion is uh, SSDs, uh, solid state drives, as opposed to uh, the normal um, uh, old style drives, uh, regular hard disk drives. Um, they are, uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to say they may even be more stable, uh, particularly when they're ba getting banged around. Remember, it's just chips. There's no platter inside of it, so there's nothing uh, to get uh, scratched if it gets re banged really hard. Um, at this point, they're just <clears throat> a lot better, <coughs> and most importantly, a lot faster for transferring files, um, which... Uh, you'll find transferring files is actually, if you're using something with a flash drive, transferring files is uh, can take a long time. <laughs> yeah, funny. Uh, what about not hooking your acquisition computer up to the net once all the software is uploaded and working well? In a sense, yes. In a sense, no. You uh, somebody's saying I would only update drivers if problems happen. Um, are you concerned about security? Do you need to auto download all those Windows updates? Um, uh, if you have to have it hooked up to the internet because you're either using the internet for plate solving or transferring files or using Google Drive or something like that, um, then maybe you do want the security updates. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I will say this. Um, I'm running an old version of Sequence Generator Pro. Uh, I am probably running an older version of PHD2. And <clears throat> last time I imaged, everything worked fine. I'm not planning on changing anything until I have issues. Um, More discussions on SSDs. Uh, can you automate taking calibration frames? Yes. Uh, I think all the programs have a method for <coughs> automating taking calibration frames. But keep in mind, you need a piece of hardware. Well, you might need a piece of hardware as well. Um, no, you definitely need a piece of hardware as well. Uh, whether it be a flat panel or a flip flat, um, just depends on what it is, but uh, with uh, a little bit of know-how, uh, you can basically automate a flat panel to turn on in the corner of your observatory, have your telescope point to it, take those flats, then go to your image. Um, a flip flat will basically just flip in front of it and is basically designed to do just that. Uh, just a little bit more expensive, but a lot nicer of a, a, of a package. Sorry about my dog barking in the background. Uh, yeah, someone's saying V-curves are silly anyways, so maybe there's something to be said for uh, this new routine. Maybe it will change. Uh, maybe it'll be a game changer when it comes to autofocus. Uh, stitching, uh, suggestion for good software for stitching images together on a Mac for mosaics. Uh, I use PixInsight for my mosaics. Can I suggest it? It's a little bit more complex to do mosaics on PixInsight, but yeah, that's, do it. That's, yeah, Adam, I don't know how to do it on PixInsight. I'll have to figure that out. I didn't know you could do it in PixInsight. Yeah, I did a program. Actually, there, there's a nice video that you can download and you can follow it. it 
It gets a little bit long-winded, but it produces some very nice mosaics uh, where basically you have your overall image, you place each of the overlapping frames on that image, and it stitches together one by one by one. Uh, it's worthwhile. And then you can process. Then you can process that stitched image, or do you have to process each image individually and then stitch them together? No, you you do it on your linear images. Okay, cool. And then and I'll then you have, have a linear up. image that you process separately. Yeah. Now, if you're familiar with yeah. the Insight. Um, David produced a, a linear fit script that I think is on his website. And for the Mosaic Wizard, uh, his linear fit script works a whole lot better than the default. Uh, now I know they've updated their linear fit. I don't know if it fixed any of that. But uh, for everyone out there, if you're doing Mosaics and Pix Insight and you run into the typical issue where you have dark uh, stuff around stars and the edges, or like odd uh, figures or whatever, uh, it, it comes down to the difference in the brightness of the images. So you need to use a good linear fit script and David wrote one. What is y'all's normal overlap when y'all shoot your mosaics? What do y'all use for an overlap? 10, 15, 20%, how much? It depends I, I, on the image. Yeah. It, yeah. it depends it, on the image and how much vignetting you may or may not have, how much gradients that you might have that you have to deal with. There's lots of issues here. Uh, the other thing I can tell you about the, the process in Pix Insight, four uh, images on a mosaic is doable. If you have 16, I figure it's going to take you a couple of days. So no, the amount of time it takes to do additional images really starts to go up. But you know, a four panel mosaic is fairly simple. You can do it in an hour or two, wouldn't you no, say? That? Yeah. If everything works out, you you do end up uh, starting on it, and if something goes wrong, you have to start all over. Uh, these, are just, these are just two panel mosaics that I ventured into and tried, and 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 I haven't been able to figure out how to stitch them together. So, actually, for two panel, you really don't need you, you don't need any kind of a script or picks inside. You can literally do that in Photoshop fairly easily. Okay, yeah, two panels really easy. Uh, or just. When you have just, three corners yeah. butting up to each other, four corners butting up to each other, that's where you really run into issues. Uh, with two panels, I, I wouldn't be worried at all. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it depends on how, ma how many stars are on that overlapping area. It's a very scarce uh, to figure out. Very busy star field, you don't need much overlap at all. But if it's, there's a couple of stars in it, you're going to have problems. Right. Everything depends on the images that you're overlapping. And I think what you want to do is when you plan your mosaic, you want to plan it so there's no critical item in that overlap area. And that's part of planning. So it's my new plan is just to drop down to my Williams Optics 71 and just get a wider field. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which isn't a bad plan at all. Um and much faster acquisition. Uh, someone's asking how these software, uh, how these three automation software programs compare from someone who, who's used all three. And I don't know if any of us have uh, used either all three or uh, I told them they have used Sequence Generator Pro, I believe, but um, I don't know. Any of us versatile in all three? I've experimented, experimented with them. And I would say that a a ACP is probably the most complete and the most expensive. Uh, Sequence Generator Pro seems like a more reasonable way to start for automation. And maybe you don't have each and every feature, but it'll do the job in most cases. Can Photoshop Elements be used for processing? Uh, I believe it can. I don't know if you can open 16-bit files in Photoshop Elements. Uh, I do believe it has levels and curves. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think beyond that. It must have layers, but I'm actually not sure. I, you know what? I'm not familiar with Photoshop Elements. So before I start speaking so much about it, I'm just going to say I don't really know. Um, I'm sure you could do a lot of the stuff we need to do in Photoshop Elements, but I'm not sure if you could do everything. Uh, 
basically the actions are really handy in Photoshop. You know, Photoshop used to be what, $500? Uh, I think $700 at one point. Um, and now it's $9.99 a month, which as much as I hate paying a monthly subscription to, for a piece of software, it's a lot easier to suggest to someone paying $9.99 a month than buying a five to $700 piece of software. So if, if hey, that sounds... Uh, if that sounds reasonable to you, it, it might be worth trying. Um, and James is saying Photoshop Elements is not that good, and he struggles with it. So that's uh, that's it. Uh, Terry's used ACP and CCDAP for uh, a few years. So uh, maybe we'll get someone who's, who's used a few of these in future shows. I see we've hit our hour mark, uh, which is that... Uh, that point where I'm trying not to go over and bore people to death. Um, Cause we did cover a lot and a lot of, uh, a lot of acquisition softwares, which I think we kind of covered pretty concisely what they do without jumping into like the full details of how you would get them set up, which would take hours and hours and hours. Uh, so we're not gonna try and do that. Uh, so that said, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to Tolg and Eric for uh, sharing your software. Thank you guys all for watching. Um, I like these kind of focused topics and we're gonna continue doing them unless we get some real presentations, which uh, hopefully we'll have a few in the future, uh, but uh, I don't have anything scheduled yet. So uh, if you like these focused topics and you have an idea for a focused topic to, uh, to do, uh, contact me in the... Uh, via the website uh, contact area and uh, it'll be a good uh, a good show hey if you're suggesting it there we go uh, thanks again guys see you guys next week